My name is Atu Kuisin, and I am professor and chair of the English department at Stanford University. I will be the host of each episode. Each episode of Contours will address a pressing issue, a theme, or concept in 21st century literary studies. In many of these episodes, I will be hosting a dialogue with an author or authors from the Cambridge University press list. Others will feature a panel of experts in the field and I will introduce that episode. We aim to provide an invigorating, accessible forum for critical debate and reflection to engage and help students, teachers, and general readers. Today's episode will be focused on four books that have been published under the Cambridge Studies in World Literature series, edited by Debjani Ganguli from the University of Virginia and Francesca Orsini, from SOAS in London. The books are Duncan Yoon, China in 20th and 21st century literature, Levi Thompson, Reorienting Modernism in Arabic and Persian Poetry, Ruan Kanto, South Asian Writers, Latin American Literature and the Rise of Global English, and Sarah Quesada, the African heritage of Latinx and Caribbean literature. Uh, rather than, um, than uh, give a brief and perhaps even distorted uh, synopsis of these uh, four magnificent texts, I'm going to hand over to Debjani Ganguli and Francesca Otsini to talk to our various authors. So Debjani and De Francesca, over to you. Thank you, Arto. Um, so uh, a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to share and showcase these uh, wonderful uh, books that uh, are a fairly recent series, uh, Cambridge Studies in World Literature, which was launched uh, only in 2019, uh, uh, will we'll present today. Um, so, uh, so Cambridge Studies in World Literature, uh, broadly, if one has to have a description, it highlights scholarships on literary works that focus on intersecting literary cultures and technologies of the textual across the globe and across various scales, local, regional and global. Um, it, world literature as a field has uh, um, you know, gained in prominence in the 21st century and some of the obvious uh, correlation correspondence with thinking our era of globalization from the point of view of literary studies aesthetics is is really the impetus uh, of, um, for for uh, the, the 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 kind of a reiteration of the field if you want to call it at the same time one can scarcely miss the disjunction between some recent influential theories of world literature that appear to perpetuate a universalist narrative of European expansion and diffusion of literary forms and the diversity of global comparatist work that illuminates literary world making across various scales and linguistic zones and within temporal frames irreducible to modern European literary history or the capitalist world system. So, for instance, our series will reckon with uh, imperial histories across time, post-imperial and post-colonial histories, but also pre-modern histories uh, uh, generated by very large linguistic and literary worlds. There's also the issue of space and scale that that we we think our series will will really uh, illuminate, and uh, the spatial scale in world literature, uh, as we know, is as urgent as questions of temporality and historicity. When we talk of the world, who is the world, and 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 who represents the world, these questions become very urgent. So books in this series will will address the problem of spatial and uh, scale um, uh, by exploring media scales larger than the nation but smaller than the globe that push against notions of a freewheeling globality and that better reflect the multi-scalar spatially dispersed nature of contemporary literary world making so for instance you'll have you know books uh, of, uh, that showcase cartography such as the oceanic uh, like Sarah Quesada's book on the Atlantic or the archipelagic the hemispheric and the multilingual local, which, which Francesca will talk about uh, in a minute. So, so 
Our series will feature books that trace the creative coexistence and intersections of language worlds from both the global south and the global north and multi world models of literary production and literary criticism that these have generated. Uh, and it's over to Francesca. Thank you very much, uh, Devjani, and thank you, Atto, and, uh, and, and to our authors, and a pleasure to be here. So I'm actually a specialist in, I still see myself as a specialist in South Asian literatures, particularly, and, and actually not in English, so Hindi, Urdu, Farsi, and so on. So I see my role in the series as kind of facilitating the, the entry and the dialogue of uh, scholars like Levi, for example, who would, you know, like me, probably see themselves more as area study scholars, but who, so not to not to be out of the field and the and the kind of scholarship and the conversations uh, of within world literature, but instead to participate. And for a long time, we, I think we were told that you know multilingualism was a kind of um, an odd oddity, particularly to South Asia. And instead, having worked on multilingual literary culture in in in, in India and South Asia, I'm I'm keen and I'm convinced that um, a, the kind of located and multilingual approach um, that I see in my work and in that of my colleagues actually has a lot to offer to world literature and speaks to a to a to an experience of the world, of being in the world, of thinking and of writing about the world that is actually very, very common. Um, so located, I'm, I'm keen to bring into the, the into the series um, books that offer located visions of the world and of world literature or particular geographies that and connections that are or become significant, like uh, like China and Africa in Duncan's book, for example, or sort of histories that are not, as Devjani says, on the global level or have a global reach like Persian and Arabic, but that are still very significant and, and certainly matter. So different ecologies, to, to use um, uh, Beecroft's term. And then the idea is that you don't just describe these literatures uh, with kind of terms and paradigms that are developed elsewhere, but you theorize from these locations. You theorize from, theorize from these um, histories, these itineraries, and, and Debjani's, in fact, history, uh, Cambridge History of World Literature, the essays in there uh, sort of do that already very well. So I think uh, her book, Cambridge History of World Literature, is really a kind of a, a guide for us to see what, you know, what all kind of possible ways there are now to do to do world literature. Really, as, as she says, different, uh, focusing on different scales and ecologies. So we think that in a way, you know, there was a, a time in which world literature meant um, taking a, a critical stand for or against systemic approaches, systems of world literature. And Debjani, do you want now to go to the talk to our start talking to our authors? Yes, I think I think that would be wonderful because it's their work that really speaks to our vision. Uh, these four works. So, um, so uh, I have the pleasure of uh, now um, in talking to Rowan, inviting you to share your work with us. So, so Rowan, your book, um, which is the first in our series, we are delighted uh, that it's already published. Uh, your books are. It's called. Uh, just to remind our our audience, uh, Rowan's book is entitled South Asian Writers, Latin American Literature, and the Unexpected Journey of Global English. So this book uh, traces a history of the emergence of contemporary global Anglophone literatures via Latin America and South Asia. Now, as we know that the category global Anglophone has a complicated genealogy going back to the idea of Commonwealth literature in the post-war era and to the emergence of post-colonial literary studies in the 1980s and 90s. So South Asian writers in particular, Salman Rushdie, Amitav Ghosh, Anita Desai, Arundhati Roy, gained canonical status and became regional exemplars of global Anglophone and post-colonial literatures. So, in your book, by tracing these unexpected encounters between South Asian writers and Latin American literatures, um, it complicates the story of what the legacy of global Anglophone literature might mean in the 21st century. Uh, so could you draw out a few strands of this story for us and, uh, and, and just tell us about your wonderful book? Um, 
Yeah, with pleasure. So, um, you know, this term global anglophone, in addition to having a sort of troubling genealogy, is also one that we haven't been using consistently as a field term for almost any time at all. I think it was sort of coming up when I was on the market for this job, and then it might not be with us in another 10 years, who knows? It doesn't have the kind of endurance that even world literature has as a term defining a field. But what we tend to see, right, is that we're describing this space, as you say, which is sort of related to post-colonial literature, which is sort of related to Commonwealth literature, and which is kind of carrying over from those terms uh, assumptions about what the center of a literary world might be and what its boundaries might be. And historically, all of those terms are taken from what was the center of the British colonial world, the jewel in the crown, and this was India, right? So in a sense, these are really old and troubling priorities for the field in which Indian uh, material and now Indian literature is potentially the kind of center or the paradigm through which we explore the rest of what these meanings and affiliations could be, right? Um, for me, one of the key conflicts is the idea that um, world literature is multilingual and Anglophone literature per the title is, is not, right? Anglophone literature prioritizes English and actually furthers the kind of global hegemony of English. And so the point of this book at a theoretical level was to show that actually instead of being kind of in conflict, these two ideas are actually conflated when it comes to um, literature emerging out of South Asia. And not only because of the work like Francesca's work that demonstrates that in fact, South Asian literature is and always has been intensely multilingual, but actually because, or multilingual within South Asia, within the territory of South Asia, but actually because we're looking at the way that that literature is not drawing on a kind of self-consistent Anglophone tradition, but instead is drawing on a world tradition and one that has a really, really interesting and long-standing relationship with Latin American literature, especially um, in translation from Spanish into English. So that was kind of the, the duty of the book was to kind of show some of the histories of how that plays out. One of the most urgent ways that this plays out is in the history of what we might call modernism, right? So when you name somebody like Salman Rushdie, he's very famous for being a magical realist, and I talk about magical realism, obviously, in this book. But really, a lot of the stylistics that he's using come out of modernism. And so there's a really easy story that, in fact, several different contemporary literary studies have told in different ways about the relationship between Anglophone South Asian literature and Anglophone modernism at different sort of um, balance points at the beginning and end of the 20th century. That story fits really well within the priorities of an English department that wants to tell itself that when we use a term of, frankly, of convenience, like the global Anglophone, that really we're uncovering a history or a genealogy. And so my job is to jump in and spoil that and say, well, actually, when you think that you're looking at a connection between Faulkner or Joyce and somebody like uh, Mohammed Hanif, who's the subject of that final chapter, when you're looking at the resonances between those two bodies of work, what you're actually looking at is this generation that you've disappeared from the middle of Latin American writers, including Mario Vargas Llosa, Alejo Carpentier, and especially um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, not as a uh, magical realist, but actually as a group of people who really seriously dug in and played with Anglophone modernism, transformed it, and used it to talk about new subjects that it hadn't been the focus of, especially the use of these um, aesthetics and dictator fiction and how resonant that then becomes to especially authors who are speaking about the, polit the political situation of Pakistan in the 1980s and onward. So that's just one example of what the book does, but my duty is to tell a story that's actually a really kind of historically rooted story and a really detailed story that gets to touch on several different kind of contemporary trends within uh, South Asian literature from the 60s onwards that illuminates just how global it always was. So, so uh, you know, your 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 book really uh, is is a very fine example of how we can generate these conversations across these various fields, and 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 uh, uh, while while being uh, 
not being defensive about using certain categories because we are not, you know, the, the, when you think of the global Anglophone, there is this kind of uh, assumption that somehow we have, you know, transcended the post-colonial category as if it's not, it's no longer, you know, uh, relevant. And our, your work and so many of your books really show <laughs> how generative uh, some of these earlier histories have been. Uh, uh, without without really settling into a kind of a routinized, uh, you know, uh, concept, routinized conceptual ground, if one wants to put it, as if it's like, you know, as if we, when we use a particular term, we know exactly what it means. No, we keep troubling those terms. We keep we keep exploring, excavating other histories to make those terms generative. And and your book does that wonderfully. I, I just wonder uh, if you want to share uh, um, uh, another, uh, you know, uh, 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 kind of uh, chapter, uh, an insight from another chapter with us. That. Sure. Well, <laughs> you know, as it happens, I'm sitting here and at the table where my computer is placed is this frame that we meant to put a picture of my daughter in. And as you can see, if somebody knows this, this is Humayun's tomb, which actually appears in the second chapter of the book as the subject of a poem by Octavio Paz. And this was perhaps the most fun chapter for me to research. Um, everybody knows that Octavio Paz was the ambassador to India. Most people um, in Mexico and India know that he was the ambassador to India from Mexico from 1962 to 1968. And people are sometimes familiar with the poetry that he wrote there. I spent some time on that poetry and especially his poem on Humayun's tomb, which is 35 words long. It's a very short poem. It's very kind of embedded. It doesn't seem to have any kind of politics, except for that he writes a footnote to that poem, which is twice as long as the poem itself. And then he talks about, you know, the location of Humayun's tomb within Delhi and the way that it's next to these sort of like developmental organizations and his his skepticism about what um, international development means in this context. And you're like, OK, well, maybe this poem has a politics. For me, what's what's so exciting about this work is the opportunity to uncover the way that not just his interpersonal relationship and the big name of, you know, Nobel Prize winner Octavio Paz had an impact on the scene of um, literature and art in the 1960s and early 70s in India. But actually looking at the kind of aesthetics that he was using, why did he write a 35 word poem about Humayun's tomb? What was he kind of trying to uncover there? What were the specific kind of Hispanophone genealogies of that poetry? And then what ways of looking were embedded in that kind of descriptive or ekphrastic poetry that then became interesting to this group of really understudied Indian poets and painters from the 60s and 70s who actually were using really similar motifs and were sometimes, you know, reading his essays. So a group of uh, writers that I got to talk about that were actually introduced to me through Francesca and through Anjali Nerlekar were these um, poets writing this little magazine called Vrishchik, which means scorpion. And they were um, citing Paz and they were interacting with Paz and then they were doing a lot of this also kind of ekphrastic poetry in their own work in ways that they saw as explicitly related to pause and to this idea of world history that was being um, explored in his poetry of that period. And one of the most fascinating elements there, you can go look at this on the Asia Art Archive, is um, Gita Kapoor's In Quest of Identity, where she's trying to come up with what she calls an indigenous art practice for India, one that she's not only deeply, deeply citing Octavio Paz and other Indian art, or sorry, um, Mexican artists and um, philosophers of the period, but she's even using the word indigenous there as a calc, right, from Spanish and from the indigenismo movement of the early 20th century in Mexico. So these are fascinating, really, really deep connections and ones that um, not only have we not explored, but in fact, this whole group of people, I think, is, is really understudied and deserves a lot more interest than they've currently got. So Rowan has just told us a story of connections between um, um, Latin America and, uh, and South Asia. So Duncan, your book uncovers another history and uh, of, of a connection and, a, and, and, and does a kind of looks at the, at the li literature of probably what is one of the biggest uh, or, um, political and economic stories of our time, which is the, the, the relationship between China and, and Africa. 
Uh, but you look at the narrative forms, the different strands of this uh, of this connection, the different imaginations um, it gives rise to. Can I? Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the um, the strands that and the connection of this connection and what their narrative configurations are? Yeah, thank you for this. Um, the one of the main underlying things that I wanted to think about in the book was these new patterns of globalization, which in fact, as I kind of went through everything, are actually really old patterns of globalization, especially if we're thinking about the Swahili coast and southern China and so on and so forth. Um, but some of the different connections that uh, that that jumped out to me were um, thinking about, uh, for example, my first chapter, a longer history of uh, Africa-China relations, especially during the Cold War. Um, so that whole chapter is focused on um, the, the poetry and the history and the life writings of Kofi Awuner, who was a poet diplomat, um, somewhat similar to Octavio Paz in the sense he actually ended up in Cuba for a while and had a wrote a whole uh, notebook on Latin America. I think it's like the notebook, I'm, uh, I'm forgetting the name of it. But anyway, these kind of figures of these poets and diplomats that are moving in between these political as well as literary spheres. And so what's so fascinating about that first chapter is mapping a cultural history of uh, the Cold War and specifically Afro-Asian solidarity, um, kind of starting then and moving all the way up to what is considered now contemporary Africa-China relations, the Forum on China and Africa Cooperation, 2000, the FOCAC. Um, and so like a deeper historicization of this phenomenon in order to intervene into the presentism of a lot of the debates surrounding Africa-China relations and to be able to go back and look both, both in terms of diplomatic histories, but also symbolically. So what's so interesting about Awuner is that he uh, repurposes the Awe dirge form of the Hino Cantor and starts to write these different poems, imagining um, China throughout three three poems in particular through a series of key geopolitical events. So um, the long, Red Army's Long March in 1935, which he interpolates into Pan-Africanist imaginings of decolonization um, in his poem then Black Eagle Awakes, 1965, Cultural Evolution, um, which for him sows the seeds of a kind of disillusionment with Chinese socialism. Um, in the Red Bright Book of History, which came out in 1989, and then a, a kind of return to a more sanguine view of modern China in his uh, poem, Xianxi Photo Dala, which is about official trip to a rapidly industrializing China in the 1990s. So you've got in the, in the work of a wooner, the long arc or the long durée of Ghana-China uh, relations moving from the the idealism, the political revolutionary idealism of the 60s and 70s in decolonization, the kind of disillusionment with projects of socialism after 1989 um, and the collapse of the Berlin Wall, everything that was happening in China during that period as well. And then this kind of return to, oh, here's China representing this new alternative uh, path for investment and modernization um, and the, the development miracle that he explores in this much later piece. So that first chapter is really great for hitting the, these kind of key symbolic points, especially in the 20th into the 21st century of what China represented to this Ghanaian poet and intellectual and diplomat. But also I think what is really interesting is that you look at a whole series of, um, of different genres, isn't it? Of, uh, of, of types of or, or forms of novels. And, and do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So each chapter is laid out according to different genres or different kinds of writing. So the first chapter, like I, I said, is a, a kind of uh, focus on um, Awe inspired dirge poetry within the context of larger geopolitics in the Cold War. Second chapter is actually focusing on genre fiction, so a, de a detective novel. Uh, Kwe Kwarti's uh, Gold of Our Fathers and a kind of a post-colonial thriller, um, the Casualty of Power uh, <coughs> by Mukaka Chimpanta, who's a Zambian author. Um, and so those are, that, that chapter is more focused on uh, representations of post-colonial masculinity, how Chinese investment triggers colonial trauma and threats of emasculation through resource extraction, all that sort of stuff. So popular fiction, genre fiction is really helpful for thinking about those sorts of questions. The third chapter is focused on memoir. And so I really wanted to focus on diaspora and different diaspora connections. So a memoir by a South African um, woman of Chinese descent, Frida Ho, about growing up in, in Johannesburg under apartheid. And then a Cameroonian memoir um, 
uh, by uh, Jean Tardif Longkong about his experience studying traditional Chinese medicine in, uh, in, in the PRC during the late 2000s. Uh, so issues of diaspora, different flows. And then the last chapter, the fourth chapter, I turn to literary fiction um, and look at Henri Lopez's, the famous Congolese Brazilian authors, um, beautiful work called Le Lise de Flamboyant, uh, The Lily and the Flame Tree, which was published in 1997, whose protagonist is multiracial Congolese um, Chinese, um, and so that whole chapter is th looking at uh, issues of racialization and multiracial identity in African China relations. So you can see it's a really fascinating and wide ranging, and in fact, uh, I mean, I suppose one, I, one of the things you do is sort of to question the, the simply African uh, sort of a single category, and you look at uh, specific contexts, but also specific histories and uh, yeah, connections and um, yeah, and and this really interesting wide range of uh, of genres. So, I mean, if Rowan, Rowan spoke about sort of the um, global English and uh, the legacy of postcolonialism and coming to world literature from that side, what you know, what would you say is um, is the intervention in in world literature that that you want to make with the book, or that you you know you are making with this book, or why do you want to sort of see it, frame it within world literature, say, rather than, or sort of yeah, yeah. adjacent as opposed to comparative literature, which would have been, uh, you know, the two, two uh, um, yeah, in a, another possible frame? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the, the the terms that I use as a Shio member is worldliness um, as a way to, to kind of position what I'm thinking about in terms of world literature. And so, Again, I think this is right in line with the with the the, the series um, goal to move away from the idea of world literature as just kind of an inventory of all world literature or these the kind of big um, systems or big definitions. Um, and so, one way to do that is to rework uh, what we understand as, especially for me, post-colonial African literature's worldliness by configuring it um, to African literary imaginaries imaginaries of China. So then that changes everything. So because of what worlds are actually being imagined in these places, this is not the world of the former colonized. This isn't London. This isn't Paris. These are not. We're not. We're not thinking about diasporic communities in those spaces. So it's an entirely different um, world um, that we imagine or use or think about when we're talking about worldliness and world literature in these texts, um, especially because you know they're they're. It's really exploring hitherto unexplored cartographies, uh, both symbolic and topographic that make up what we think about world literature as a way, and I love the way we were talking about it earlier, as, to, as a way to kind of repurpose world literature from the local and rework um, epistemological thinking literary studies by, by starting from these local vernaculars and then moving outward. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Debjani, should I pass it on uh, to you? Yes, so... Uh, to Sarah. Uh, so, so we are uh, now moving into yet another story of, of uh, African connections around the world. We'll, we'll turn to Sarah Quesada's uh, uh, book that is probably going to be published in a month's time uh, from uh, Cambridge. And so Sarah, your book, uh, The African Heritage of Latinx and Caribbean Literature, uh, it really captures how the African Atlantic haunts uh, Latino Latina writing in the Americas. Um, and uh, it's fascinating how you trace um, uh, Latinx writers, um, uh, how they exhibit symptoms of an Afro-Latino Atlantic haunting in their works. Uh, and the stroke of haunting in world literature is very resonant. Uh, and you analyze especially the inscriptions of spatiality that Latinx fictions offer as in some ways a restorative uh, textual memorials of a long denied or misinterpreted Atlantic identity. So could you give us an example or two from your book about this history and stories? Thanks so much, uh, Dajani, and it's such an honor to be in the series, and I can't wait to get my hands on all of these books that have been discussed. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll just preface my remarks by saying that uh, this book grew out of an interest, or I should probably say a, a restlessness with seeing blackness in US Latinidad being theorized without Africa. Um, so in the same way that scholars had contested how US Latinidad intended to exclude Latin America and Latin Americanness from transnational studies, I turned to the transatlantic uh, 
uh, which of course has a tendency to think of connections between European and American connections, which is why I'm so excited to hear about my, my colleagues work. Um, so in my book, I center Africa and its particularity to bear on Latinx writing, mostly some Caribbean-ness like Garcia Marquez and Alejo Carpentier. And I signal um, that uh, some of these, you know, mostly uh, mostly were widely read authors of Latin American descent in the last 50 years have been engaging with African modern history from the more recognizable era of the transatlantic slave trade, but also uh, the quote unquote 19th century scramble for Africa, the 20th century decolonizing missions in Africa during the Cold War era. And then what is important to, to this book, and as Devjani mentioned, in, re, with regards to sites of memory, I also look at the neoliberal turn in which uh, the UNESCO slave route project came into fruition in the continent. So uh, what's humbling to me is to see that so many of our most endeared authors um, are, you know, the, from whether it's in Latin American studies or Latin, Latinx studies, have been centering their preoccupations on Africa. And uh, what is strange to me is that this might seem very startling. Because to give you an example, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who we've been talking about, so happens that in 19, 1970s wrote one of the most detailed accounts of Cuban assisted Angolan independence uh, reports, unbeknownst to many except with my students. Um, and uh, this is arguably a text or the only text that has no critical edition. It's perhaps the one that's taught the least. It doesn't have much to do with magical realism. So perhaps that's one of the reasons. Uh, but this leads us to think the or to come to the conclusion that African decolonial wars, despite la a lot of Latin American intervention, US intervention, had very little weight or carried very little weight on Latin American canonical thinking. And this is just not true. Um, in fact, this is more widely a gross mischaracterization of world literature. So, so in this book, I, what I try to do is uh, to use Garcia Marquez as an example that I bring into the imaginary of Latinx literature, is to uh, see how interview after interview, Garcia Marquez attests that Angola, his writing on Angola, were some of his most passionist, passion uh, journalistic writing. And that Angola, he says, actually produced nightmares that were hard for him to recover from. And more importantly that Angola, and here I'll try to sort of unfold what I'm doing very just very quickly in the chapter here, is that Angola functions as a key that unlocks a missing pieces of a novel that took him 30 years to write, and that was Chronicle of Death Foretold, Cronica de una Muerte Anunciada, which at the time of its publication was uh, the, the book that sold most copies um, for Garcia Marquez. Um, and so in the chapter, I think about how a point of access into Angola in this novel is actually the appearance of a slave ship, which um, shipwrecks with the souls of Senegalese, um, for which I argue that this the Bay of Souls is named. It's the Boya Bay of Souls in Cartagena is named after the shipwreck, uh, the shipwreck, but it's not memorialized anywhere in Cartagena. It is a shipwreck that's contained in the archive that I found in the French archives of all places in Les Archives de Département d'Outre-mer in Aix-en-Provence. And um, and it's also a slave ship that is used by Fidel Castro to uh, make this rhetorical um, claim on Africa by saying that because Cuba received so many enslaved peoples from Africa, that it's Cuba's duty to intervene in African sovereignty. And so, um, so the, this site of, of memory of slavery in Cuba is uh, used to the same extent as the sites of memory in Senegal. Um, if we recall President Barack Obama visiting Gore in, in Senegal, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very prominent site of memory in Africa that a lot of heads of state visit. But it functions in the same way as this rhetorical device that Castro uses. And in the case of Garcia Marquez, it also functions as a site of memory that unveils a Latin African textual past. It reveals this internationalist preoccupation of an author of the caliber of Garcia Marquez and his interest in African sovereignty. But more importantly, I think the weight that this African history carries in the constructions of race in the Americas. Um, and so I think I'll, I'll stop there, but um, all this to say that these representations of Africa are, are far from unproblematic. Of course, this is an imperialist um, text in Garcia Marquez, right? And so the book also complicates what to do with all these problematic associations of, of Africa that come up in these in our endeared texts. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you, uh, Sarah. If you could take just one minute uh, uh, to to um, tell us how comfortable are you to situate your work uh, within under the rubric of world literature and what it does for your work as again, say, talking to Africanists or just Atlantic historians. Yeah, so yeah, thanks. So I think um, thanks to Jenny, I think that one of as I sort of mentioned in the my initial initial remarks, one of my discomforts, I think, with American studies broadly construed is these theorizations of race, whether it's blackness or indigeneity without you know, thinking about the comparative scope of uh, transnational studies trans and the potentials that those fields have. Um, and so when it comes to Latinx literature in particular, I think that some of our most endeared writers, like the two godfathers of Chicano literature that I write about, Tomás Rivera and Rodolfo Anaya, have a tendency to be pigeonholed in this sort of ethnic uh, marker in which um, they are beholden to um, stereotypes or um, expectations of what their ethnic realities might convey. And when they come into world literature, they get circulated as much and they become essentialized um, and uh, or, or exoticized, right? And so I think that what my book tries to do is to convey that these are not only writers for our Latinx writers or for ethnic studies, there are writers of the world and they have a reach, a global reach um, that we do uh, little justice to if we read them through this prism that world literature can circulate. So I actually find that I use the platform of world literature to say, actually, these uh, uh, these authors are writing a world literature of its own, and that happens to be a Latin African literature um, that this book, you know, unveils. Thank, uh, thank you, thank you. Just quickly, Francesca, before that we come back to you, one thing that uh, all three books share, so Rowan, Duncan, and Sarah, is an alternative horizon of uh, inspirations. You know, because it's very commonplace to speak of uh, postcolonial African literature, for example, as drawing inspiration from canonical Shakespeare, Milton, and so on. That's kind of standard. People don't even comment on it. But now we are seeing in all three books alternative sources of inspiration. These were uh, authors that had a clear a clear sense of uh, south south solidarity but solidarity of the mind so not just the political solidarities let's say between Nehru and Nkrumah or, or Castro and Rawlings but but a, a, a solidarity of a literary inspiration a, a reimagining of the world so that the world in world literature is uh, configured completely differently in these three texts. So if you read the text, uh, all three together, the sense of world literature that you would get would be completely different than if you assumed world literature to be worlded in, in Euro-America. So this is just what I see as, uh, you know, bringing all three together. Yes. Yes, which I also think has to do with um, one of the one of the projects of the series, which is to, to bring a longer history, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of, uh, discussion or critique that has been of, of war literature as being very much linked to the kind of um, the contemporary uh, globalizing moment and uh, sort of global neoliberalism and so on. Whereas I think if you start bringing this, these other histories and these multiple histories in, then um, in fact, I think one of the one of the critiques of, you know, that war literature is not as uh, as political as postcolonial uh, uh, as postcolonial studies or postcolonial post -colonial literary studies, I think if you heard uh, Rowan, Sarah, and Duncan talk, you know, there's a lot of politics there, but it's not necessarily the, the politics of empire or no, there are multiple kinds of politics at, at work there, and certainly um, politics is, is there. Um, now, if I can turn to, to, to Levi, and um, uh, whose forthcoming book is called Reorienting Modernism. A modern mapping a modernist geography across uh, Arabic and Persian poetry. So we come here to um, a kind of another story of modernism, but also kind of interesting another scale. Uh, so you compare uh, 
your book compares, uh, takes in fact what we've been talking about, a kind of located and multilingual perspective in the Middle East and compares poetic modernism in Arabic and in Persian, so adjacent, but of course also um, interacting and intermingled um, through the prism of tradition and what they do with tradition. And, and particularly you use this sort of really interesting term, you introduce this interesting term that I think works for um, modernism, you know, in so many other many other parts of the world. So the sublation of tradition in terms of figures and themes, but also formal elements of meter, so the kind of bread and butter that, that poets work with. So can you can you kind of explain how this works and sort of introduce us to your book a little bit? Yeah, I'm happy to, and I'm so pleased to be here today speaking with all of you old friends and new and hello to the audience. I, I really am happy to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the book um, ahead of its publication shortly, uh, inshallah. So um, I, I'm very happy that you bring up how I work with this concept of sublation uh, that's coming from Hegel's Aufhebung, continental philosophy. We're probably all very familiar with that, but I'm taking this idea and bringing it to the local traditions that I'm looking at comparatively in this book. And I'm thinking about the sublation of figures, themes, and then most importantly, for the cross-linguistic connections between Arabic and Persian that I highlight in the book, forms, uh, specifically poetic metrics. So um, alongside that, I'm also looking at pre-modern connections that are retained in Arabic and Persian literature, specifically modernist poetry. And this is important because poetry remains the prestige genre in the region throughout the 20th century, maybe even today. I mean, the novel is there, but poetry is really where everything happens at. So uh, I say in the book, um, our understandings of literature and its changes needs to pass a litmus test in the poetic traditions in both these cases. So that's why I'm looking at poetry. And the modernist poets uh, across these two languages reimagine and revivify not just certain figures from the pre-modern world, like Omar Khayyam, who wrote the Rubaiyat Quatrains in the 12th century, Farida Din Attar, a mystical poet who uh, wrote a book called The Conference of the Birds that a lot of poets draw on. That was in the 13th century, he wrote that. Uh, another iconoclastic mystic who shows up a lot, the Sufi Al-Halaj, who was executed by the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad in 922 CE. So here, Thing, modernism 922 to 1922 in say the west with the wasteland uh ulysses I, I think the first episode of contours is actually about a reissue of ulysses so connecting into world literature there a little bit um so anyway it's it's not just these figures that they're sublating in uh, modernist poetry across arabic and persian but also they are retaining aspects of arabic poetic metrics um, which the modernist poets contend with in highly intricate ways, but ultimately end up keeping parts of rather than, say, doing away with them entirely and adopting European forms, which is uh, the narrative that we see in English criticism, at least on these two traditions, basically uh, looks at the disconnect. I'm looking at connections over time. So um, to explain in detail how the formal retention of meter works across Arabic and Persian takes about a dozen pages in the book, but I'll boil it down to a sentence for today. Um, the modernist writing in both traditions give up on a monorhymed columnar form of the pre-modern Arabic Qasida, which if you've seen a traditional Arabic poem, you know what this looks like. The Qasida is an ode, uh, and that form dates back to the sixth century, at least, maybe even further. Um, so instead of the entire line of a Qasida ode, the modernists take a singular poetic foot from that form uh, rather than the line as the basis of their metrics. And this happens across linguistic contexts in almost exactly the same way. And this is the amazing thing. This is despite the absence of direct communication between the modernist pioneers in the Arab world and Iran. So that's highly compelling. Why would these modernists keep this feature of pre-modern form in the same way in different contexts when they're also clearly expert in European poetic forms and might just as well have given up Arabic forms entirely. And it's really interesting with the Persian poets because Arabic prosody, the science of it and how it works, uh, doesn't actually function that well when applied to Persian. So uh, we might expect them to do away with this, but they don't. Um, and it's from this shared formal basis. And you can see here how my disciplinary training as area studies person is figuring in here with the focus on linguistics and form. 
Um, and it's from this shared formal basis that I move outward to situate Arabic and Persian modernist poetry within a broader planetary movement of modernism. So here's where I get to world literature, uh, because I'm looking at Middle Eastern modernisms, as I turn them, as an uh, active participant and creator of what world literature is. And it's really helpful to me that the Euro-American modernists, who we've talked a little bit about already, uh, primary among them T.S. Eliot in the cases of the two traditions I'm looking at, uh, these Euro-American modernists drew on ancient Near Eastern myth as well. So when we go to the wasteland, we clearly find Eliot explaining in his notes how central the myth of the Mesopotamian deity Tammuz's story is for his poem. When the Middle Eastern modernists incorporate that same deity's story of death and rebirth into their poetry, there is, of course, the mediating role of Western modernism's outsized influence in the movement. But uh, the Middle Eastern modernists are somehow closer to the mythic origin. And I'm here thinking of a group of Arab poets in particular who called themselves the Tammuzis after the name of that god. Uh, poets like Adunis from uh, Syria and Lebanon, Badr Shakr Sayyab, Abdul Wahab al Bayati from Iraq, uh, all of whom I address in the book. Um, several of those, or a couple of those poets, get full chapters uh, in the book. Um, in Iran, the first modernist pioneer who went by the pen name Nima Yushij. Uh, puts the same myth of death and rebirth at the core of his poetics. So, for instance, his 1938 poem, Kognus, uh, which means the phoenix, see how clear that is, uh, draws not on Western models um, for of influence, but rather local Perso-Islamic ones, like Attar's story of the phoenix in the Conference of the Birds, all the way from the 13th century. And there are some formal indications that Nima is referencing that um, poem. So overall, this... Poetry calls us to question what world exactly we're talking about when we talk about world literature. And your work, Francesca, and your colleagues at the Muosage project at SOAS has been really useful for me thinking about this. Um, so we're, it, the poetry makes us question what world we're talking about when we talk about world literature, because the literary forms and themes that I point out are shared across Arabic and Persian, and they don't stop there. Uh, I, I don't have the linguistic ability or space in the book to address these broader connections, but they do move across the entire Islamic world and show up in many other languages as well in very much the same way. So looking further afield, I know for a fact that we find similar things happening in Kurdish, Turkish, Urdu, and then I'm going to say probably many other languages that were highly affected by the presence of Islam and Arabic uh, poetic formal structures following the Islamic conquest in the seventh century up until today. Um, thanks very much. I, I really am happy Thank to you. share this with Thank you. Thank you. And um, so you've already talked about how, you know, your book um, speaks of a sort of a, or compares uh, to, to the sort of um, Middle Eastern uh, sort of modernist uh, um, currents and, and, and groups of poets, but is, is directly connected and, and engages. And in fact, it's very much uh, entwined with a, with a sort of a, a global history of, of modernism. But I can also, you know, I wanted to ask you, I mean, because this has been also my kind of personal challenge when, uh, you know, used to writing to um, sort of area read, uh, specialist and, and what has been for you the experience of pitching your your scholarship and your, you know, your way of writing, um, your knowledge uh, to um, to an audience whom you can't, you know, expect to, you know, to, to be a specialist one. So you know, where you are talking to two audiences at the same time, and and I suppose my question is, has this added something to your book and to your writing? You know, so has it been a, a challenge, I suppose, but also has it done something for you? Yeah, I, I love that you asked this question because it, it brings up a disciplinary problem about books uh, within Arabic literature, Arabic poetry more generally. Um, we, within the field, our engagements with literature are often sidelined or um, ignored really by folks who are working on world literature as a concept. And this is because people publish generally with specialist presses for a specialist audience that is invested in knowledge of the language Arabic or Persian. And there's not this um, 
need, I suppose, to more broadly engage ideas of literature as a worldwide phenomenon. So for me, uh, coming from an area studies background, I did have the opportunity during my PhD at UCLA to take several comparative literature courses. So this helps me with the theoretical chops uh, to make myself legible to comparative literature scholars uh, on top of all the performance of knowledge one must do within area studies to show that you have the linguistic knowledge <laughs> to engage these texts. Um, but for me, uh, working with a press like Cambridge with a global reach and uh, need to speak to an international audience has made me very cognizant of the types of poems I'm engaging with, who I choose to um, go on about at length in the book. Uh, I, I on purpose chose poets who have at least some translations into English. So people who are, can only engage with this poetry through English have the ability to go and see some of the work these poets have done. Of course, I translate some things myself as well in the book. It's necessary to do that. And um, the difficult part of that aspect of the book is my focus is on form. So how do you translate <laughs> things like rhyme and meter from Arabic or Persian, uh, which uh, the metrical system is uh, quantitative rather than qualitative. It's completely different than English. So I'm thinking about these things uh, in terms of translation as well, and then generally translating these ideas for a broader audience. And um, I think that has been a good process for me because it makes me more able to speak to a wider audience than just specialists, which is all you really need to do in the field. Yes, but I want to bring Arabic and Persian into broader discussions and bring the Middle East into discussions of modernism as a significant geography, using a term that you've pioneered, Francesca, uh, within modernism generally, and seeing how it fits in that system. Our time is to stay running. Any last words, Debjani, Francesca, anyone? And then I'll do the final. Uh, you, you should go ahead and do the final. So uh, thank you all for this uh, very magnificent uh, gift offering. Uh, for me, what I take from this is um, not just uh, new ways of uh, reconceptualizing uh, world literature, but also new sites for thinking. Uh, this Francesca has, has introduced us to this new sites of thinking the world. Uh, and not only that, the new uh, bookshelves, this is this, a term that Rowan Cantor uses in her book, a new bookshelves that we are obliged to unpack to understand our place in the world. So thank you all very much. And uh, I hope to my readers that you find contours, the Cambridge Literary Studies Hour useful, enjoyable, relevant, and more importantly, that you are able to join us again in the next episode. Thank you all. <laughs>